by beholding his love. If you have your Bibles with you, would you please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse 18. I think this sets the whole premise and explains our whole existence here on this earth. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. This verse is telling us we have a purpose on this earth, to be transformed into his image. I was one who claimed I was born this way. I was one who said, this is who I am. This is who I am. There's nothing I can do about it. This is who I am, and there's nothing you can do about it. But I had learned, I had come to learn the I am. As Jesus tells us before Abraham, there was I am. Do we know the I am, brothers and sisters, before we can even claim this is who I am? <clears throat> Sorry. A veil. What is a veil, brothers and sisters? A covering to dim, to protect. I walked around my whole life wearing a veil. You see, I struggled since I was five, six years old. At the same time, I have shared a similar story with Ron. At four years old, I was violated. It's hard. <clears throat> this is our, my family. <clears throat> this is in 1985 when we were baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist movement. It's my parents down below, myself, my brother, and my sister is also here, and you'll be hearing from her this afternoon. This is me at four years old. I'm going to leave this here for just a little bit. My mother still, to this day, has a difficult time looking at this picture because all she sees is the sad eyes. But this was me when I was violated and experienced a loss, a drastic loss, a painful loss for both me and the family. You see, brothers and sisters, when I realize the Lord's true intentions for my existence, I realized that I wasn't broken. I wasn't the only one broken. <clears throat> My family was broken. And we're taught in today's society to run from family as soon as we earn this independence, right? I mean, I remember my first paycheck, do you? Do you remember that when you first got your first paycheck in life that you wanted to like buy everything in the world, right? When you, you, when you got your first car, right? I remember when I got my first car, I felt like I could drive forever around the entire world, like I, I did not sleep. This surge of independence that's so preached by today's society, we're taught to move away from families when we're 18, and even parents to this day encourage their kids, when you're 18, you're out of the house. And but many biblical narratives, we learn that children do not leave their parents until they're married. And even that, they stay mainly with the male, the men's parents. We have gone away so far from 
biblical times, haven't we? In today's society, we learn independence, self-reliance. Being codependent is so negative. I kept myself very busy um, when we got baptized. I even went to Loma Linda University, La Sierra campus. Um, I'm dating myself there. <laughs> um, and then I became a student missionary in Hawaii. Someone had to go to Hawaii. <clears throat> so I volunteered. <laughs> it was pretty scary. But I was there for a year and a half. I became a student missionary there and was a teacher for grades three to six. Ninth grade algebra, assisted in those classes actually, and became a Pathfinder leader, a Sabbath school teacher, and all the while struggling, struggling with something. And you see, I wanted to keep busy so I could look busy, so I could look spiritually busy. Don't we do that sometimes, brothers and sisters? We try to look spiritually busy. We try to look okay. All I have known was I was drawn to girls, and I kept this dark secret to myself. As soon as I returned from Hawaii, I couldn't go back to Loma Linda, um, financial aid reasons, <clears throat> and I found a job. I got my first car, I got my first paycheck, and I left the church. I had a secret relationship with another woman during that time, but it didn't work out. She went her way and I went mine, and that was in San Francisco. It didn't take very long for me to fit in. I got myself involved in every ism effort. I became a very bold social and political activist in San Francisco. I walked every street corner, everyone knew who I was. I soon became a domestic violence counselor for the straight and gay community. I soon met a woman and we had a relationship for eight years. In the last two years of our relationship, we wanted to have a family, and so we did. By artificial insemination, we had a little girl. She was born November 15, 2001. <clears throat> At that time, a law had just passed. It was the AB 25 law. And I was the first to file under this law. This law afforded domestic partners who were registered with the state of California the ease of adoption, an ability to adopt each other's children as parents already and not as strangers, affording a, a rather easy process for them. I was the first to file under that law in the state of California. NBC News got wind of all of that, and I was on the papers and interviewed for months. Unfortunately, my daughter was only 10 months old when we broke up, when the, when the relationship dissolved. I shortly got involved with another woman, and that relationship was literally from hell. I was beaten and abused. I allowed the very thing I fought for happen to me. And I wondered, I often wondered why, how this could have happened. By January 1st, as a result of this relationship and as a result of the choices I made, January 1st, 2005, I was homeless. I lived in my car, not too long ago, seven, eight years ago. I often slept in front of a 24-hour Starbucks. Thank God for Starbucks. There was a place I felt safe because it was just a hustle and bustle kind of place. There was people there all the time. And I had my coffee in Danish every morning. And I had my, stru my structured chaos in my car. <clears throat> and it was hard sleeping in my car. In the middle of the night, I would have to wake up because it was freezing. Winter time in the Bay Area can be pretty harsh. Probably not as harsh as maybe Arkansas, but it was pretty cold. <clears throat> I soon found a job and was able to um, find a home for me and my daughter. At this time, our, my daughter was going back and forth between her and her other mom. Her other mom was the birth mother, by the way. It's 2008. 
and something was going on in 2008 in California, and nationwide actually. What was it? The elections. We were electing our president, weren't we? But specifically in the state of California, there was a proposition. It was Proposition 8. And oftentimes what I get when I ask, what is Proposition 8? People say, oh, that's about same-sex marriage. No, it isn't. Proposition 8 is specifically about protecting marriage, to keep the definition of marriage to be between a man and a woman. That's what Proposition 8 was about. The yes side will win <clears throat> and keep the definition of marriage. The no side was fighting for equal rights. The gay community came full force, and I was part of that. A lot of hurt, a lot of disappointment resulted as Proposition 8 passed. Both me and my daughter. <clears throat> it was with this that the Lord turned my life around. It was with this that the Lord revealed himself to me. One day in the bathroom as my sister was visiting, the Lord revealed something to me and reminded me in my mind, scripture from God's word. Specifically Hebrews chapter seven, eight, and nine, vividly I saw in my mind. I immediately ran to my closet where I kept a bookshelf. And just like Ron Woolsey's story, my mom throughout 20 years would leave things behind. Oftentimes in my linen closet or in the bathroom in the magazine, and I'm treated to a little glow track or a book. So as this vision, if you would give me this opportunity to say, a vision came to my mind, I ran to my closet and opened it up and pulled out my Bible that's been sitting there for 20 years. And I finally realized, oh, I have a Steps to Christ. I have a Desire of Ages. Oh, and look at, I have a whole volume set of the children Bible storybooks still wrapped in cellophane. So I laid all that out on my coffee table. My attitude was I was not going to change who I was, because I couldn't, right? Because I was born this way. <clears throat> I started reading, and I started taking the Bible with me wherever I went. <clears throat> and I did come across that verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, specifically. 9 and 10 I often heard as the clobbering verses of going to church. But I read verse 11, and it did stood out to me, and such were some of you. And I, and I wondered, wow, that's past tense. Okay. Okay, Lord. So I started having these conversations with God. And he goes, keep on reading. So I read when he said, and you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified. I said, wait a minute. That sounds familiar. So I go to Hebrews, and I go to the verses that I saw in my mind, chapter 7, 8, and 9, and it talked about Jesus' priestly role in the sanctuary. Are we dwelling in the sanctuary, brothers and sisters? Are we finding him there? <clears throat> Oftentimes, and during this time, it was, it was puzzling. I started going to church. I started keeping the Sabbath. I was taking my daughter with me every other week, as the custody was. And I was having a glorious time every Sabbath. I felt every sermon was just for me. The sermon could have been about tithe giving, and I would be in tears. Because for 20 years, I said, oh, I had forsaken, given my tithe. I was experiencing conviction after conviction, sitting in the back pew next to the exit door. Because after every sermon was done, I would leave. No one needed to know my business. That was my attitude. And plus, I didn't come to church to change, as I thought. It was one Sabbath. It was a communion service. 
and I'm sitting in the back pew, and I'm having this conversation with myself, and I'm like, Lord, I can't do this. It would be pretty blasphemous of me to partake of communion service. I'm a lesbian, remember? And this is how I was talking to God. And right at that moment, the pastor says, take a leap of faith and watch what God will do. Not you. God will do it. And right at that moment, I felt he pointed right at me, and I went, is that you? Do you really want me to do this? I said, okay. I'm in tears, and at the same time, I'm having this horrible attitude. I'm in tears. I'm, okay, okay, Lord. It's all on you. This is on you. You made me this way. <clears throat> this is all on you. And brothers and sisters, my life journey has been always on him. I lean on him today, and I realize the conviction that he soon fell on my heart one particular Sabbath afternoon as a small voice came to me and said, my child, if Sunday is a counterfeit to my Sabbath, what do you think is the counterfeit to my creation? Brothers and sisters, the word counterfeit stuck in my head, but it's not what God was telling me. God wasn't telling me that my life was a counterfeit. Yes, my life and the choices I made was not according to what he wanted for me. The counterfeit, brothers and sisters, or what we call the lie, is that I had turned worship from the creator to the creature. Romans 1.24 says it best, doesn't it? <clears throat> Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. The lie, brothers and sisters, is self, the self-fixing, the self-justifying, the self-confirming, and self being the complete opposite of God and who he is and who he is all about because it's not about me and where I've been and what I've done. It's about Jesus, what he's done, and where he wants to take us. The homosexuality was just one of many veils, brothers and sisters. And since turning my life over to Christ and sitting face to face with him every day of my life, that veil has been removed. God has bigger fish to fry in here, doesn't he? So as far as temptation is concerned, that's all gone. Amen? Amen. God is good. I see a sister in front of me. I see a woman in front of me now. I see her as a sister in Christ. He's actually put new desires in my heart. And I'm praying for the man that he has prepared me for. And I, want, I long and I desire to show my daughter a relationship of God, a sanctified relationship where she can have an earthly father, if that is his will. Me and my sister had a really cute experience. Yes, God does have a sense of humor. On one of our long trips down south, we, were, we stopped over at a Trader Joe's and my sister had to go to the bathroom, and I was conversing and uh, talking with the cashier gentleman there. And I was just smiling, and I was admiring the way he was being so friendly and his smile. And my sister, as we were leaving the store, my sister jokingly goes, she nudges me. She goes, I saw that. <laughs> so you saw what? She goes, I saw you flirting with that cashier. I'm like, I wasn't flirting. <laughs> we're not supposed to do that. I said I was just admiring his smile, and he was so friendly, you know? So we were walking towards the parking lot, and, and um, she goes, you know what, sis? I noticed, though, that all the men that make your head turn now, or you kind of 
you call admire, um, they all kind of look alike. So she kept on walking, and I just stopped, and I stopped in my tracks, and I was just like, oh, wow, Lord, thank you. You're showing me that I have a type. <laughs> Isn't God good? It really warmed my heart. He really tickled and warmed my heart just to show that. And I was just praising the Lord all day long, and my sister was just cracking up. It was a beautiful, beautiful experience. I wanted to go through a little bit more of these pictures for you. This was me, 1998. Yes, I was one of those who were called or referred to as butch. I wore men's clothes. I adorned men's, um, a man's haircut, men's watch, men's shoes, men's socks, men's everything. <clears throat> this was me. And who you see today is a work of God. And as a result of a heart, a heart change, he's changed my desires. And most importantly, he's also bringing healing to our family. This is my daughter. She was seven years old. She was seven years old in 2008. Did God have a plan? Yes, he did. God is good. Um, this is the verse that we, I just read to you. Here in, third, um, in volume 3, Testimonies chapter 11, Sister White tells us that the warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. Amen? <clears throat> Washed, sanctified, and justified. Here are the verses that we see. This is the verse that really caught my attention. And not so much the past tense of were some of you, but the fact that the Lord brought me into his sanctuary. <clears throat> it's really about his righteousness, not mine, for we have none. And brothers and sisters, to this day, I spend time with my gay friends. I see them, I have dinner with them, and I love them. Actually, when I shared with them that I was no longer gay and I had a beautiful experience with Jesus Christ, my best friend's partner took me by the hand and said to me, Verna, I'm so happy for you. It seems like you found the love of your life. This is my gay friend's partner telling me this. I praise God. My concern now, actually, I'm still a work in progress, brothers and sisters. Often find, oftentimes we're confronted with doubt. I had an experience at a convention not too long ago. Someone sat next to me. I had my eyes on Ted Wilson. He was there. I just wanted to chit chat and have an opportunity with him, so I was following him wherever he went. But <clears throat> um, someone sat next to me and she goes, So, what do you call yourself now? She knew of my story. And I kind of went, What do you mean? She goes, You know. And I thought, Oh, redeemed. <laughs> oh, she said, Oh, that's a good word. I said, yeah, I'm redeemed. And so she sat there and she goes, so how long have you been redeemed? And I said, oh, going on three years now, I believe. She goes, oh, you'll be all right for a while. And I turned, I said, what do you mean, sister? And she said, um, you know, you guys usually go back. And to this day, I think maybe she was being facetious. I don't think she really meant any harm. <clears throat> and I turned to her and I said, you know, sister, I pray every day that I don't go back to that. I fall back into other things, like overeating sometimes. We turn to food instead of to God in the middle of the night sometimes. <clears throat> I could fall back into lying any minute. I could fall back into a whole gamut of stuff. 
But I pray every day that I don't go back to that. I have, as far as I'm concerned, I have no desire to. And I appreciate your prayers, sister. I really do. And I know the conference is praying for me. I thank you for your prayers. I gave her a hug and I walked away. God soon told me, these offenses or this doubt that comes, they're not doubting you, Virna. They're doubting me. Are we doubting Thomas's brothers and sisters? Do we demand to see the scars of Jesus before we believe? Or do we want to touch those scars because we believe? We all have scars, scars of which signify of wounds that have endured and persevered. Sometimes the wound beneath is not fully healed and the scar acts for a layer of protection. Jesus understands all of this. But the scars of Jesus is what really matters. For they are the scars from a death no one can ever fathom a death that I look to every day for healing and for rest. Surrender, brothers and sisters, is key. We don't only have broken individuals, we have broken families. We have families who are enduring scars. God wants to bring healing not only to the individual, but to the families. It is his scars that by his grace I allow to cover me every day. And imagine this, brothers and sisters, when we all get to heaven, we will see the very scars of our Savior. I praise the Lord and I give him all the glory for this conference and for what he's done in my life. And I look forward to what he has in store for everyone here. Remember, brothers and sisters, if there is someone struggling in your family, God is calling us to all, all of us, to a level of accountability in our families as well. I pray for you. Please pray for me.